Hi, team. Thank you so much for accepting this interview. Uh, it's a huge uh, honor and pleasure to do this uh, dialogue and to talk a little bit about your uh, your music and uh, tell us some stories. So, as a first question, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, something about your language and your aesthetic uh, in music. So, okay. by listening to your uh, earliest records like uh, Fulton Street Mall and your most recent one, like uh, with the Snake Oil project, it's possible mm -hmm. to hear a clear uh, difference in your language uh, in both a uh, composition and improvisational manner. So, how this evolution uh, happened and what are the thoughts um, that you had while making those uh, changes? Well, I'm not sure the I'm not sure the language has changed. I think it's um, I have more vocabulary. I know you know what I mean, but but I think my basic approach hasn't really changed since my first record in terms of my ideas about improvisation and composition and how to use them together. I think I developed it, you know, obviously listening to Julius Hemphill and, you know, the, that kind of rubato improvising sure. that he used to do, collective improvising and the writing, guys like Roscoe Mitchell, Braxton, you know, just the way they, their ideas about texture and sound and composition and how to, how to use those things and combine them. Um, I think I've had those ideas. I've been using those ideas, pretty much the same approach for all these years. But I'm getting better at it, hopefully, and, and acquiring new vocabulary. So, sure. so in a way, I'm not sure. I'm a, maybe I'm not the best person to judge, but I don't think the language has really changed that much. The players change, so of course, sure. you know, it's like making a movie or something. You know, you change sure. actors, you change something, and so they're the characters, you know, in in this drama, you know, that's going to go on for sixty years, probably. And, and so when I change the characters and I change the, the instrumentation, automatically that changes the sound. And the sound is where you, you know, that's whenever, that's where everything happens. It's from the sound. Sure. And so um, obviously Snake Oil, it's, a, it's an acoustic project for the most part. And, uh, and you know, Fulton Street Mall is very electric, yeah. obviously. Um, and that, you know, the writing is, is, and my playing is much, much more developed now. You know, maybe sure. it's more mature. I don't, I don't know. You know, I've played more, so I have more seasoning and more um, experience. Sure. You know, so that, yeah. That, yeah. As you that, said, uh, maybe not, not the language, uh, not, but maybe more the intentions uh, developed yeah. and become. I wouldn't say the intentions. I would just say that. It's getting more sophisticated, sure. possibly, yeah. you know, because my ideas, hopefully I've gotten better since then, you know, otherwise I'm in trouble, but you know, that's almost 35 years ago. So, you know, obviously sure, I've, I've gotten better. And from, from this aspect, I, uh, I, to talk more in deep in uh, some aspect of your music, uh, one aspect that I really found peculiar and interesting in your music is how uh, in each of your composition has a strong amount of counterpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, like if you listen to each voice singularly, it would have the power and the strongness to be uh, great by itself and yeah. be even more good when you combine two or three voices. Uh, so how did you work on this aspect of your music? Well, I mean, I always feel that, that the each line, whether it's a bass line or whatever, should be able to function by itself and make for an interesting, you know, it should have some kind of interesting melodic content, rhythmic content, you know, just make it in, something you could play by itself and, and it would work. Um, and then I think my particular 
kind of counterpoint you're talking about that's probably started maybe in 2000 when I started playing with piano players a lot. Okay. Um, Craig Taborn specifically, like I think it was 2000. Yeah. And the so I started right? writing. I started writing on the piano and kind of writing for the piano. So it's quite a bit of different, you know, if someone, if you're playing two, two lines together on horns, it's very different than a piano player playing both lines. Sure. You know, at the same, because it, it connects in a different way, you know, and, and, and so I was doing things with Craig where, you know, he would play two lines and then I would double one of the lines and I could play very, I could kind of ghost it with my sound. I wouldn't have to carry the full weight. So it, added, and it created an interesting texture and you could really um, feel the rhythmic um, impact because a piano was there. You know, if it was guitar and alto or it wouldn't have the same impact, it wouldn't have the same connection. It's sure. really connected because one person is controlling the phrasing, you know, on, on that. So that was a big, um, that was a big change for me, I think. And I would say the period starting in 2000 is pretty different than the pre 2000 period. Okay. You know, I think I had some of the same ideas, but then hearing them on piano really changed how I was um, writing, I think, you know, because it, it created a different, you know, just different possibilities sound wise that, that I was kind of afraid of for a long time. And then, you know, it has a lot to do with the player, obviously, sure. Craig, Matt Mitchell. Uh, I did some stuff with Django Bates. You know, these are all guys who, they don't play like piano players, if you know what I mean. Uh, it sounds like an entire orchestra. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, they're not afraid to play one line. Sure. They don't play everything because it's there, you know. And so, so um, they really know how to play with horn players especially weird horn players, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so that really changed my way of thinking, I think, um, and a certain, you know, my, my composing strategies, I think really changed and the possibilities increased a lot, you know? Sure. Maybe even from the fact uh, of the like percussion, percuss percussive element. Percussive, of the, absolutely. Yeah. Of the timber That's of the exactly. piano. Totally. Yep. Yeah. In fact, I will like some last year in uh, 2020, I was uh, trying to read some of your music uh, mm -hmm. on the guitar. Uh, I even posted on Instagram uh, uh, an, uh, an, excerpt, an excerpt of uh, Who Evil's Expanded. Uh, right, right, right. And it works like uh, just if it, if it was uh, written for playing it on the guitar it works it works yeah, perfectly yeah, yeah. and yeah. from from that point i found interesting how the voice is combined and actually how the harmony is generated by those mm -hmm. voices do you do you think sometime uh, just about the single voices or uh, how they move uh, through the unapologetically harm harmonic uh, vehicle or it's just uh, my ear telling me what I like and don't like you know sure creating tension and then really and then resolving it occasionally and um just yeah just just uh you know the, the harmonies that I like and also you know creating some kind of rhythmic interest but I can't really explain it it's not something that's preconceived okay. I don't have a you know I don't say to myself okay I'm gonna write something that blah, 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 or it's going to sound like Bach or, you know what I mean? So it might be that I listen to some music and it, it, you know, inspires me to do something similar to what I was listening to. You know, sometimes, you know, you listen to something like Bach and you go, oh, that sounds so simple. You know, I could do that. Yeah. And then you write something that doesn't really sound like that, but because you're trying to, something different happens. And, and those two part, when I was writing all these two part things with, for Craig, it was, uh, you know, just things were starting to change, you know, just the way I heard things and, and the way I was used in harmony and stuff. But, but I don't, you know, I don't really plan ahead and say, oh, I'm going to write this kind of harmony. Or, I don't sure. even know what I'm doing, but, you know, it's just my ear. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe that, that, that uh, let you appreciate it more, actually. 
And I mean, you know, you just use the shit that you know. I mean, I don't think what I do is any better strategy than anybody else. If I had, I would love to be able to do anything, you know, and have all kinds of technique, but I don't. So I just do the shit, you know, it's just sheer, it's, it's all desire. You know, I want to do it. So I do it, you know, I want to, I really want to do it badly. So Absolutely. I kind of work on this stuff till I'm satisfied, you know? Absolutely. And to, to go more uh, deep on that, uh, how, when you, how the project of Forage uh, start, the piano solo rendition uh, made by... Oh, it was just my idea to do, for Matt to do a solo record of my music. And then I said he could pick any tune he wanted. And he, and I, you know, he has so much of my music. And then I also said you could combine different tunes together and basically do whatever you wanted. So that's what he did, you know. I probably suggested a few things that I wanted to hear that I liked. I said, yeah, maybe this tune would be cool or blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, he picked the stuff and, and chose the approach. You know? okay. So maybe like at the beginning, you know, he sent me something and asked for my opinion, but mostly he pretty much, you know, did what he wanted. Okay. Okay. And how... I just did another one. Uh, there's a guitar player who just recorded Oh wow! a solo record of my music that was kind of similar thing where I sent him a pile of music and he chose, and then we talked a lot. With him, we talked quite a bit because he's kind of young and he wanted my opinion. And also okay. David Torm was talking to him and we kind of suggested some kind of, you know, occasionally some kind of approach. And, awesome. But uh, similar, similar thing. When, when it will be released? Uh, it's coming out in June. It's, uh, it's finished. It's mastered and we have the cover. We're just, you know, waiting for the production part. Awesome. But I have it, you know, I can send you files if you want to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Really good. This guy's great. We're actually okay. doing a duo gig on Sunday. Wonderful. It's acoustic guitar, not electric. Wonderful. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm really looking forward for this. Sure. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, to go back a, a, a little bit, how mm -hmm. I know that you start uh, playing the the alto like a bit a bit late. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were at first like a, a fan of uh, uh, the the avant-garde musician of the period, like Brax. Well, everything, not just avant-garde. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I was listening, I, you know, I was listening to McCoy Tyner, Joe Henderson, sure. you know, Miles Davis, Sonny Rollins, everybody. Sure. Uh, you, I, I've read on the the interview with uh, Evan, uh, Evan Iverson that you were, uh, that you went to the Syracuse and listened to McCoy Tyner three quartet, maybe? To New York. I went yeah. to New York. Yeah. New York, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, how did you start playing the alto? Who were you? Uh, just an accident, you know. My, somebody was selling a horn for a hundred bucks, and I was kind of bored. I was in college; I had a lot of free time, at that, and so I uh, bought it and then just started fucking around with it. And then I decided I wanted to take lessons, and I moved to New York and went to college near New York. And then started taking lessons with, uh, I took a few lessons with Braxton. I studied wow. with uh, Julius Hampill. And then I yeah. studied a classical teacher named Les Scott. You know, so so then I just started, you know, taking lessons. I guess that was 1974. Okay. Oh, so like just three, three years, four years before you did your first uh, record? Yeah, I think that was 79. Okay, wonderful. Cool. So so you had like a, a, a strong voice uh, so quickly? On the other uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. Absolutely. So <laughs> how, how, how uh, you met with Braxton? What, what was your... Uh, I met him in Europe. In 1972, I was, uh, I went to Europe with a friend of mine. Um, I didn't go to college for a year and we, I made some money and then traveled with my friend and I went to Paris and I knew that these guys from Chicago were in Paris, you know, Akita Carroll was there, uh, Braxton was there, all these guys. 
And I went to this place called the American Center because I had heard that they all would go there and hang out or practice. And so I went there and there was Braxton hanging out. So I started talking to him and, you know, we had a friendly conversation and he gave me his address and we corresponded a little bit. And then uh, he moved to New York in 74 and he said he would give me a few lessons and then he got very busy. So um, he gave me Hemphill's number and I called Julius. And wow. then we had a long, several years of kind of study, not not always formal, but hanging out and, you know, sure. talking about music. And how to go more on deep on uh, your relationship with Julius Enfield uh, as a mentor, a teacher, and a friend? How it was your like? How it was his uh, approach to teaching? What is I, well, the first, the big thing was he was very focused on sound. You're one, you know, getting a good sound. And so he showed me a lot of ways to work on my sound with long tones and overtones and different things. And, and <clears throat> that was, that was huge, you know, because I basically, if it, whatever he said, I would do it. And so he said that. And so I started, you know, doing different kinds of long tone exercises almost for an hour a day, you know, wow. so my, my sound developed pretty quick, you know, the other stuff took a while, but, and then he encouraged me to write my own exercises. So I would make up these little exercises and then that got me composing. And because he was a composer and I used to see him doing it, I just assumed that everyone composed. So I started composing, you know, awesome. you know, making things up. I don't, I don't know if I was a composer, but I was writing things down and, you know, learning how to notate music and stuff like that. And he was like giving you some tips about how, some techniques about composing, uh, how to approach. No, not techniques, mostly just doing it, you know, and, and I mean, sometimes he'd show me little things about dynamics and things, but sure. basically he was just uh, very positive. You know, he encouraged me to do it or he didn't discourage me to do it. Like sometimes, you know, if you're a beginner, You know, I studied with Jimmy Jufri for a minute and wow. he was sort of very, you know, kind of traditional in a way. And so, you know, if you're a beginner and you start writing music, he's, you know, most guys will say, no, nah, you can't do that yet. Uh -huh. So with Jufri, when I wrote music, I brought in some music. He was very surprised because I wasn't very good on the saxophone. So he couldn't figure it out. But the reason I was able to do it was... I was never told not to do it, you know, so I just kept doing it. And, you know, I had limited uh, rhythmic, my rhythmic ideas were pretty limited because of, I didn't know that much, but I, but I was, um, I don't know, I was good at making stuff up, you know. Sure. I think. And did some, did, did it happen that you see him like composing some of his music and yep. you were sometimes just talk about, uh, Uh, how he worked on his music and stuff like that? No, he just, he, you know, he would give me these answers, cryptic answers. You huh. know, I'd say, I'd say something like, how do you write music when you pr have to practice? How do you write and practice? And he said, I don't. And then I figured out what he meant was when he was writing music, that's what he was doing. He didn't practice, you know, because mm -hmm. if you do try to do both things, it's hard to get momentum, you know, with the writing. Sure. So when I'm really writing, I don't practice. I just, you know, at the end of the day, I might play a little bit, but I, but I don't really, um, I don't practice, you know, like, sure. and so that was something I learned, you know, you gotta, if you're going to be writing, you gotta do it. You know, it's just like playing the saxophone. You have to do it all the time Absolutely. to get better, you know? So, so you get a flow going, you know, if you write every day. Eventually, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I read that that you did this for like the first five weeks of the COVID nineteen pandemics. So that you were writing like uh, I read this in maybe some of the latest interview that you did for uh, Sacred mm -hmm. uh, Vowels. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, like I mean, at the beginning of the oh, the pandemic thing, once all my gigs got canceled, I decided that I finally had some time. And for a while, there was nobody knew what to do. You know, they were just yeah. home all the time. So I would just write melodies all the all day long. I just sat at this big table and wrote melodies, and then played them. And I did that. I don't know how long I did it for, but for a while I was doing it every day for, you know, probably five or six weeks. And then, then I decided that I, since I was playing by myself all the time and playing these things, I, um, I would, uh, I've always wanted to make a solo record, but I, yeah. you know, I didn't really want to do it in a recording studio because I felt like it would make me uptight. And so I wanted to do it at home, but I was never had the nerve. And so this was a perfect chance. So I, you know, I was talking to my friend, David Torn, and I said, yeah, I want to do this thing, but I don't really want to set up a microphone or anything. I just want to record it onto my phone so I don't get nervous or anything and self-conscious. And so one day I just went upstairs into this little room and just started playing these pieces and recording them onto my phone. And, and then after about three or four days, I had a record worth of material. And then I sent it to David because he, he masters these things for me. And so I sent it to him just to ask him if he thought the sound was good enough for him to work with. And he said, yeah, and he made it sound good. And, and then, and then we talked about him doing the same, you know, putting out a solo record because he records at home all the time. And, and yeah. so we put out these two records, you know, I started a, label, a digital label and you know, I have my bank yeah. account. It's called nine donkeys. Yeah. And so we had, a. Uh, I have a band camp page and, and, I did the covers. I do the covers on my phone. I have an app oh, where you can okay. upload a picture and just put, you know, just fuck around with it. So I got into doing that when I was on the road, I would make posters. And so I decided I would do everything myself and just have it be super low cost, funky thing, you know? And so I started doing the covers. I did his cover and mine and then they did really well. And so then I said, Oh shit, I'm gonna keep doing this. And so I started finding archival things, you know, live recordings and all kinds of stuff and putting them up and, and, uh, David always masters them. And, and so it gave me something, you know, more than just sitting around complaining or worrying, I actually had some kind of thing going on, you know, and, and I was still yeah. engaging with an audience, which is, which I really need, you know, I need to engage with people, even if I'm not performing. Yeah. You know, I think it's totally important. Understand. You know, it's hard to do the stuff in a vacuum. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So that that what the 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 motivation that's make you start posting like more stuff on Instagram, like a yeah, it's just a way to get you know connect with people. I don't make a big deal out of it. You know, I don't. The quality is probably terrible, but but okay. it's fun. You know, it gives me and also it's it's a way to focus. You know, when you're documenting something your focus changes sure and so it keeps me kind of it's like doing a little mini concert you know three minute Absolutely. concert or something it's a good way to just kind of break you know during the day just have some kind of thing that i do you know, every day yeah especially I, i really appreciate some of the the like sometimes i i was just uh, looking on this the sketches that you published and try to play <laughs> uh, or, okay, yeah. and i found like the you published two videos of the same uh, composition and one yeah. played by bill frizzell and one played mm -hmm. by you yeah uh, uh, that strikes me up because at first it, it was wonderful like uh, a really beautiful composition, especially how you played it and how Bill played it. And mm. that met me, make me, made me think about uh, your first duo and I think only uh, release that you made with yeah. Bill, uh, theoretically. And yep. how, how uh, you met Bill? I how this... 
I met him in the early 80s, I think. Okay. I'm not sure how I met him. I, maybe through Paul Motion. Okay. I During think. the recording of uh, Mutant, uh, Mutant vari Variant? No, 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 no. I met him. You know, Paul, he was rehearsing with Paul in New York okay. when they were starting the, the, the quintet. And uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I think I met him through Paul. Okay. I think I went to one of Paul's rehearsals. And we were talking, and you know, I knew Paul a little bit, and, and so uh, I've been playing with Paul, I think, since 1981, and so I think I met him, you know, at one of Paul's rehearsals, and cool. and then we decided to get together and play, and then the same day, somebody called me up and asked me if I wanted to come to the studio for free, and so I said to Bill, "Hey, let's go to the studio." So we went and did the record. You know, so I think it was the first time we played together. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Maybe maybe there will be another record of uh, you and Bill in the future. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Man, that's something I wish so much. <laughs> it it would yeah, be so be cool. I mean, we get together sometimes and yeah, know, we're good friends. I know that it was like a, a a concert that it was streamed with you with Bill in. Uh, like a, in a court, yeah. yeah, in a trio or quartet situation. Mm, and trio. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And so, to talk more about some of your other projects, like uh, Big Satan, uh, that involves uh, people like uh, Mark. Mar Mark Ducre. Can you talk a little bit how you met Mark, how the project start? I met him in 1988 in uh, Germany. We were at this thing called the Baden-Baden Jazz Meeting. Okay. And there are all these different people from different countries, and, and Mark was there. And Yeah, I really connected with him. I, I loved his playing, and he was really serious, you know. And, and so after that meeting, I think I, I was started a band, and I called him and asked him if he would want to do a tour. And so he came to New York, rehearsed, and, and then we went on tour. And that was maybe 1990 or something, or 1991, that band Chaos Totale. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so we did that. And then after that ended, we did Big Satan. You know, we've always, I've been in some of his groups. And we still play together. You know, we played together in uh, February. One of my last gigs was with Whoa. Mark and David Torn, Chess Smith and uh devin hoff bass player mark and david in the same uh same project yeah yeah that, yeah. that should be something out, out of the world yeah it was incredible it was great yeah yeah sometimes sometimes i think about mark is actually now recording a project with my music also with an ensemble in france wow yeah he just started i think on tuesday just just your compositions yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Would it be released yeah. with the Screw Guns uh, record? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. I don't know much about it. He just told me he started doing it. Yeah, cool. Well, sometimes I, uh, I was telling you, I think about Mark and David, and they are so, so underrated as composer and um, just musicians. They are so great. Like, I know, uh, I know. It's 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 unbelievable how underrated they are. Yeah, yeah. It's like, really. Uh, I mean, they're kind of legendary, but then they're not really on the radar of like, especially journalists and stuff. I, yeah, I find yeah. It hard. It's kind of shocking, but sometimes the best people aren't really. Yeah. In some ways, it's a good thing, you know. Totally agree. Like if, you're not, if you're not fashionable, that's probably a good sign. Totally I mean, Mark, agree. I mean, David's incredible. David's a brilliant genius, and Mark is. You know, those guys are just guitar playing, composing, everything. You know, David, the production stuff he does. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. At the end, I some some of the like nearly all of the music of the new music that I check out is like mixed by David, like uh, yeah. the music of Matt, the music uh, your music. Yeah. Uh, the music of Miles Okazaki. Uh, so Formanex, he did the Formanex big band. Yeah, uh, the Colossus. Yeah, wonderful. 
Like it sounds so great. Yeah. All the ECM records he he produced, all of mine except for the first one. Wow, the snake oil. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful, man. It's, it sounds so good, like so organic, yeah. so natural. Yeah, it's always different. It always does different stuff. It's, it's awesome how a so great uh, musician could uh, do like other things uh, great in the same way. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yes, so to to come talking about some something about your music uh, by reading some of your scores, uh, like uh, when I was studying uh, Waves Expanded and uh, some other stuff. I sometimes I read like uh, uh, there is an open section or the, or ad libitum or. Uh, uh, to use like an, a, a vamp for uh, open improvisation. And I try to think how uh, you managed to organize the improvisation and the composition part in your music. I mean, if it's a good band, you know, if the band has been playing together a lot, I don't have to do too much. You know, I just have to write some interesting music and then tell them when to blow, you know. <laughs> Okay. And and not really I don't really have to say, oh, you know, this should be a duo, this will be a trio. You know, it happens organically. I mean they know that I want contrast. So to create contrast, it can't just be me telling everybody what to do all the time. You know, it works best when everybody else takes responsibility. Okay. So, you know, you sort of train these guys to um most people, sidemen, are used to being told what to do. So I had to train them not to think that way, you know, and try to try to take more initiative themselves. Okay. And it works pretty well, you know, if you get the right people. And so, and, you know, a lot of those things, I mean, you know, I have, I, I save certain things, but not much. And then I let the writing kind of do the rest, you know, so maybe, maybe there's some, you know, crazy improv going on and then I'll just write something that, I want to float on top of it and that creates a different kind of tension you know relationship you know and the transitions are important you know just moving forward i think it's important not to um treat everything like a solo like oh i'm going to take a solo then i'm going to stop you know it's the soloing or the improvising is kind of continuous even if you stop you know the next person kind of picks up on it and I don't really want things to end. I don't want the energy to stop. Okay. The intensity. I don't want the intensity to stop. You know. So you know when you see a band and everybody takes a solo and then they stop and then another next guy takes a solo, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. same kind of flow. And so I want to try to avoid that. You know. Okay, so it's not something that you think so much about it when you're writing your music. Yeah, I do. I mean, okay. I, I want to write something that that uh, that promotes improvisation. Sure. I mean, that makes you want to improvise. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, it's not easy, but you create an atmosphere where everybody is is uh, not afraid to try things. You know, they they know I'm not going to yell at them if they do something that maybe doesn't work. So they're, they're list they're really paying attention, you know, cause they want to have input, you know, there's nothing better than being a side man and feeling like it's your band, you know, like Absolutely. you have, you have the same, so the same yeah, so I'm trying to create that, you know, clearly it wouldn't sound like it sounds if it wasn't for me because I'm writing all this music and organizing it, but still, you know, I give them a lot of freedom and then that makes, then I make sure the stuff, uh, you know, changes every night. So it's not the same. And that's one way to do it. You know, I don't always say, okay, this one has to always be in a groove and this part has to always be abstract. You know, I just let them figure it out. And Chess Smith will drop out at really strange times because he knows I like that, you know. So whenever he feels like stopping, he'll just stop, you know. Okay. Same with Matt, you know, okay. same with everybody. Okay. So it's and... nice that way. Okay. So when you're writing like the music for for example for Snake Oil, you're you're writing with the musician that will eventually play it 
in mind? Yeah, usually. I mean, sometimes, you know, I write things that I can play with different people, but okay. I usually start out writing for Snake Oil, for sure. Okay. You know, awesome. quite familiar. I and mean, we've been together a long time, I think. So, so. To, to, to move on a, a, a bit, mm -hmm. how, what, can you please tell the story behind uh, the Skryogan uh, records? I know that Julius uh, had uh, uh, his own label, and yeah, the, I mean, I had another label in the yeah, 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 another, another, and I, I was certainly inspired by him, and and uh, I thought it was a good thing, you know, to have control over your shit. So, and I like the design part of it, and you know, it's fun. And so I, I had a bad, I mean, not a bad experience, but I had an experience with a German label, okay, called JMT. Yeah, I read about end, it. It didn't really end very well. And, and I learned the lesson that I learned quite regularly is that no one cares more about your music than you do. It would be nice if they did, but, but in the end, you're the one who cares the most. And so if, if you get to the point where you're complaining about somebody else, then you have to do it yourself, you know? Sure. Otherwise, stop complaining. And so I've always been someone who, who can do that, you know, and, and, and so I stopped my relationship with JMT and, and, uh, and then it made me excited. I was like, okay, I'm going to start a label. And, and I, I wanted to start a label that was very much the opposite of what he was doing. You know, I wasn't record. I was all, it was almost all live concerts and kind of bootleggy kind of recordings. <clears throat> That I thought people liked, you know, and I thought, oh, this will be cool. We'll just, and we'll make the covers look really funky. And, and it was kind of fun, you know, and it worked very well until maybe 2002. And then, you know, the world, you know, the internet ended sure. everything and all the streaming, all that bullshit. And, and so when Napster started, I mean, at first I thought, well, that won't affect me because I'm so small. But eventually it created a, a um, culture of young people that didn't want to pay for music. Yeah. Didn't think they had to, didn't think they should. And so that eventually carried over, you know, the record companies. Absolutely. Yeah. It just turned into a mess. And now it's, uh, you know, now it's insane to put out your own records, but I still do it, you know, because uh, I don't like answering to people. I don't like, um, Followings, yeah, I don't know. I just get, I, I just like to do things at my own pace, and I like, you know, I like having control over the artwork and stuff. Absolutely, and that's that's the same reason that that you do the the other uh, label Nine Donkeys during the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic. Yeah, Where's... I just wanted to do something crazy that might maybe work give me an outlet and also create you know, you can get pretty creative. Yeah. And all those, you know, all those records, most of them were live. I think just the solo ones weren't, but, but it's fun okay. digging up all these old concerts and, and, you know, and then I have a relationship with intact, which is really nice sure. in Switzerland. And they do, you know, they're doing the snake oil stuff. They're putting out the broken shadows record in May. Um, yeah, so I have, you know, I can work with them, but they don't mind if I do my own thing. And, yeah, that's cool. and I work with this label called Relative Pitch, which is oh. this guy, Kevin O'Reilly. He's a good friend of mine. And so he's going to put out the guitar thing. And okay. he put out the duo with me and Nasheed, you know, and and uh, and we still use the same art. You know, Steve Byram does the covers and Torn does wow. the make mastering. And so I have a lot of different outlets, you know. It's cool to have a, a, a free relationship with other labels in this way. Yeah, for me, it's important. You know, I realized, I mean, it was good to be on ECM, but at a certain point, it's too slow for me, you know? Mm. Uh, and so I had to kind of move on. And, and Intact's been cool. You know, they don't, they don't mind too much if I put out these other things, you know? I mean, it's sure. such a small business, it doesn't really matter. Sure. I just want to document stuff, you know. and especially now that we can't perform, it's it's important to connect with people. I think. Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I when I look 
at the Skurgan Bandcamp page. I like to go on the the description and read about the, the all the stories behind the record. That, like you said, mo especially especially in this time, most of it is uh, just bootlegs or some recordings that you have in your own. Uh, like you, you have st stacked, uh, collected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's actually it's a wonderful way to to share those uh, yeah, yeah. those recordings. I was I was curious about about like uh, your practice routine or uh, uh, like like you, you said you are a super prolific composer and you tend to like uh, write. Sketches. Well, I, and... sometimes I am. Sometimes I am. Not all the time. Okay. You know, lately, I've just been practicing. Oh, okay. You know, so I practice. I look at etudes, like classical etudes. Oh. And then I, and then I practice. You know, I memorize the tunes of mine that I'm gonna possibly perform. And then I improvise. You know. Okay. So it's kind of like those three things, you know. But I like to sit around and play, you know, these Bach things arranged for saxophone or. Oh, okay. Blue sonatas, just shit like that, you know, just to read through it. I, I enjoy that. And I was curious about your your uh, influences, uh, musically speaking. Like, uh, uh, I know, like, Julius, of course, uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Braxton. And, and if you can expand, like, about your yeah, influences. I mean all the ACM guys, you know, influenced me at one time, certainly just a very original approach. Um, you know, everybody, I mean, God, it's just so all kinds of pop music, you know, just all, all kinds of stuff. Um, okay. you know, Joni Mitchell, uh, Roscoe Mitchell, um, uh, Rollins, Miles Davis, you know, the usual sure. Joe Henderson, Coy Tyner, um, Cecil Taylor at some point, you know. Sure. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. I mean, all, <laughs> all those people that you... Garrett. Okay. All those people that you were, like, watching live. <laughs> yeah, Sam Rivers, I used to see him play quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. Uh, where? The Slots? In New York, at his loft in the city. Yeah. It's called Studio Ruby. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I was lucky. I was living in New York since the seventies, so I saw you know there's all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, I I know you like you're living in Brooklyn like for fourteen uh, forty years since yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, a long time. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I was curious about if you are planning to do some other project. That you're working on during during the COVID nineteen pandemic. I, I, might, I might do some kind of trio thing with Hank Roberts and a woman named uh, Aurora Neeland. Okay. Um, and it's hard to think about it. I mean, I don't really know what's going to happen. Like, sure. Uh, they're going to be gigs. Who knows? You know. So it's I'm not really there yet. You know, I'm not really thinking of new things because I can't really do anything. Yeah. So. You know, I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens, I guess. Records, you know, I'm thinking more in terms of recording and anything. Okay, so you're like thinking more about your, some of the music that you will uh, release with the screw gun, all of those bootlegs. Yeah, the intact stuff, you know, that's coming out and the solo guitar thing I've been working on, you know, I've been focusing on that for the last couple of months. Okay. Getting that ready, and, you know. Okay, so. so wonderful. Thank you. Like, yeah, man, thank you.